All right. It's all yours. So I'm Proctor, as Claude said. I'm been to a number of these. It got pulled in with the pod and the previous organizer getting me to come in and visit about the Functional Geekery podcast I do. And I've just hopped back and forth sharing some stuff before and just tried to join up when I can. Uh, I'm up here in North Texas, DFW Metroplex, so not too far. And hopefully I'll be able to make it down to Houston one day and visit with you all in person again. So. With that being said, we did something at work. End of last year, we were having some we run closure and we run closure on Node.js. So there is lots of JavaScript world and promises and stuff in that. And we actually run it on land because because we run it on lambdas. So uh, Andrew and one of the managers at this time at the time, Chris we started having these discussions and we're like, we got it to be able to open source a interceptor library, but just into that, it was, let's put a talk together and just share interceptors because they're an interesting idea that I don't think gets quite enough love. Share screen first. Going to take over full screen. Top one. Let's start sharing that. And now do you see the presentation? Am I getting the right screen on it? Okay. So this is introduction to interceptors. As I said, we started doing this this is a pattern that's in the closure community. And I was digging in because we found the pattern was there, except not quite hooked up. So found a couple of tutorials about what they were, looked at the code base, read the code. One of the nice things about closure is it's open source and the fact that you can actually dig in and see all the libraries that you want to use, even if you might not be contributing contributing to them. And it's a common thing to just to jump in. So I wanted to share the idea because it reckon it feels familiar from other things I've seen in the functional programming language. And I wanted to, especially with this group, knowing more people with static typing based off F sharp and some of the ML stuff, wanted to put it out there and kind of see what the static typing world equivalent would be. So functional programmers, what do we love? We love drawing the lines between data calculation and actions as Eric Norman talks about. I know he was here as a group with his book, Rocking Simplicity, but essentially drawing those lines between here's the thing that's pure, here's just data, and we can manipulate data as much as we want. And then here's all our side effectful stuff. Where does this go through? And being able to draw lines and delineate those and not have those all mixed together and in the internal, because as you talked about, all your actions pollute everything else. So you have an action in the middle, that action gets contaminated with everything else. And, and it's hard to test that and isolate things. The other thing we love is data oriented programming. And I know I thought it was trying to get Johanathan. I don't know if he ever got Johanathan to, to coordinate because with a time schedule, if he did a did a lunch ish meeting for Johanathan or not, but, no, but we got someone else. Okay. Yeah. But again, it's data. Data is first class. Data is distinct from the code. We try and go generic data structures, everything static and immutable when we can get away with it. We even like our functions as data because functional programming first functions are prog functions are data. We can pass them around as much, but so when we can isolate things as data and treat things as data, we love that. We love that as much as we can. Calculations. We can transform data. It's pure. It's composable. We can stitch things together. How many times do we use a, this operator here is a threading operator in closure, but it's the pipe, what, pipe greater than in F sharp, the 
pipe operator in Bash and Unix scripting, being able to stitch these together through a common interface and flow that data, or just even calling compose on functions is something we all love doing and we try and do. Where it gets messy is actions. You have one shot to do it right, because if you don't, you have your other side effects that you can't necessarily undo easily because they may have gone out of scope. You don't necessarily have great visibility into your pipeline of when do I do when do I undo something? If I get to this point, do I pass along some sort of state that says I need to roll back or undo something that I did previously? Uh, but they're also the end goal. We wouldn't be doing anything if we didn't actually have the act actions in there. So they are needed. It's just trying to tame them and keep the pieces that make things easy and pure and manageable aside and separate from the messy things that are dangerous to do and affect the outside world and potentially have consequences. But those are the consequences we generally want. It's just we need to make sure we don't mess up how we do those. So data transform, transformation, simple and easy in the closure sense. It makes it very small, very focused. You know exactly what you're doing. And you can just say, hey, I've got this other thing here. I can pull this together. I can reuse these functions and just compose these functions together. We all talk about map, reduce, filter, those data transformation stuff and how we just kind of stitch them together and munch them together because there are build, basic building blocks. Until it's not, we get the world of exceptions. 400 errors, 500 errors, timeouts. Ooh, we didn't check out for timeouts. We left that connection to the HTTP or whatever open. We never actually put a timeout on this. So now we're hanging for 30 minutes and we don't know why because we didn't actually do the timeout. We have infinite loops. We have duplicate message sends. These are all the things that make it hard that gets our code into the dumpster fire that we all hate trying to put out especially if you if you get it not from your little trash can fire into the dumpster fire because you haven't caught it in time. But we've solved this stuff. We got try catch. We got try catch finally. Hey, we can do this stuff. It's a solved problem, except it's not because all those problems we can handle become an extra pain when they're asynchronous. Now you have your asynchronous resource handling that you have to do because that exception got thrown was on a different thread and you're now awaiting a result from somewhere that finished in a different space and time continuum than the code you're currently running. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, there are certain patterns we have with open. A different languages have file, like you take you open a file or you open some kind of open up closable thing, you pass something that gets opened to a block with a lambda or a block or proc or whatever your language calls it in a lot of cases, like Ruby even has this stuff and Python has this, where it's like, hey, you give me something, I'm going to run it in, a, in what we call a function or a lambda that's nested, and we will handle the return value and cleaning up those resources when that thing fails, even if an exception happens. You've got promise catch. you got promise finally. These last three are, if you're familiar with Clojure, there is a couple of things with Core Async, which is their Clojure Go Routine kind of stuff, similar to Go's Go Routines, uh, continuation style path, CSP stuff. Uh, but you've got error channels, you got error returns, you got pipelines with error handlers. So, hey, that's great. We've got, they're solved again. And we've got them solved for asynchronous errors. Except, what about the finally? So it's finally for non-blocking asynchronous calls. Try and do a finally on something that went off asynchronous, you're going to get a callback or promise or future of whatever kind of thing that happens. And if that thing aired, now you have to have some sort of global mutable state that you have to keep track of everything you fire off and then collect everything back once those things finish. If you've ever off file process is node and tried to do a map kind of thing in node land. Uh, had this a number of years ago, we had translation files that were being processed in node. 
you have to know how many things you catch, send off, wait for the callback, count those callbacks, accumulate. You send off, you send off 10 files to process. You got to wait sure you get 10 callbacks before you, before you can finish and return. Otherwise your job might not be done. Uh, so how do you do it finally? You have to put some state somewhere and usually that winds up being global mutable state. And if you're not careful, you step on each other with multiple requests because you don't make it at least thread local global mutable state. It's true global mutable state. So enter interceptors. This is where we found this helps with our problem. Where you might have seen them. If you're familiar with closure land, there's pedestal. There's reframe for the UI, uh, kind of a React-ish inspired, OM inspired turn on React that gives you interceptors in the UI. There's Safari, which does another kind of stuff. Eric Normand had a blog post about here's interceptors and starting from and building interceptors from ground one, Lambda Island, another closure thing. So this is a thing that's come and go, gone in the closure community. There's various adaptations. I think looking in their Slack channel, they have a interceptor sub channel for that. And I think they have about seven or eight libraries that people have done at various points for trying to address these problems. So it's a common, it's a common pattern in closure or it's a, it's a familiar pattern in closure, at least it's not uncommon to see, but I haven't really noticed anything else like them in any other language I've encountered, which is why one of the reasons I want to share it and put the idea out there, because it's a really interesting approach to how you handle this stuff, especially as functional programmers. So what they are, essentially most of it boil, every implementation pretty much boils down to, it's a set of three functions, usually done as a map with an enter, a leave, and an error function. And each of those functions takes a context, and returns the context. And what are they? They're control flow, they're partly dependency injection frameworks because you put things on a context. So you hydrate your data, you can do some system setup, you can put in different dependencies, stick it in the context, and your context it flows through all these interceptors. It's a processing definition. You can say, hey, here's a chain of interceptors that are going to go through. And now you kind of see a same way you have your thread operator, your pipeline operator that you do. You've got a processing definition. It's going to go run through these discrete steps. Maybe there's some branching in there later based off some other things, but you can kind of, you start to see a, here's how your system flow goes. Uh, railway oriented programming. Most of us here, I think, for the people who have been here, it, familiar with railway oriented programming, talked about from Scott Veloshin. I think I've heard other people reference it at these talks, but Scott Veloshin, F sharp for fun and profit, has a post about railway oriented programming where you design things, and this is using the either monad or a result monad or a various kind of thing. Even promises are do the same kind of thing. It's like, I'm going to do this, 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 then, 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 and promise JS promise world. And then I have my catch that handles my errors when I go off, off the nice path. So I set up my nice path and I go off and I have handlers for the nice path. There's a little bit of state mode add in there too, because what you, your context almost kind of sort of looks like a state monad because you do your state, you create a state monad and you do and maybe even a free monad. I'm less familiar with free monads, but you have this thing that flows through your monad transformations and they happen and the state gets accumulated. Uh, Haskell has resource T and conduit. I've seen high level glimpses of. The brief descriptions kind of sound like that idea in Haskell. There's a little bit of aspect oriented programming in there with some of the stuff you can do because everything's just data. Uh, and I'll, I've got some demos, I can show you some stuff at the end, but because it's for data and we have functions that manipulate data and we treat everything as data, we can modify that data in the middle of a pipeline in a transformation. That's a little more advanced, but it starts to give you some aspect oriented kind of stuff that you can start to say, 
here's my basic definition, but I've also got things that can transform that data and add, add extra stuff to it. Uh, and then our threading and pipeline values. So again, we're all familiar with pipelines and threads and composition. So it's kind of like that. So conceptually, how do they work? They're threading macros, but instead of just running forward through the pipe operator, they also turn around and run backwards. So once you get to the end of the pipe, it then that's through your interchain, and then it will turn around and run through your leave chain or your error chain and let you have things that run backwards to have a success case, an error case handling, and clean up your resources as well. So you open up a database. You can have an interceptor that manages your database connections. You can have that and it gets turned around. And if you need to do cleanup, you can put something on a, on a leave exit kind of thing or an error. It says, if I come back through this route, take care of my resource cleanup for me. So it's not just a, you run forward through this, you run forward through this, and then you run backwards, giving everything that ran before a way to clean back up after itself. It's very similar to the middleware concept in a lot of web frameworks where you have a response handler, you have a request handler and you have a response handler. The catch is you have request and response. What interceptors kind of add on are the error handling path as well. So you're putting things through and you're coming back out to get a result at the end. Uh, so you have your success case, you have your error case handling. You can do potentially early termination. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. If you're familiar with Closure, you can kind of think transducers where you have like a reduced or you can, because it's data, you can just change your pipeline in the middle and be like, I fit this condition. I'm done. Don't do anything else. Just start returning through the pipeline and give me a chance to clean up after myself. And the other thing they do is they help unify synchronous and asynchronous handling. So by returning your context, you can either return your context in a lot of cases and a lot of the patterns. You can either return that context as your data object, as your map. Or you can return that in your future of whatever it is. It's a promise, it's a future, whatever it is. However you do your asynchronous world in your language, you can return that. And then the executor will then await that for you before it moves on to the next part and start to feed that through. So you write your code as individual stages, stitch them together as if they were all synchronous. And then if you have asynchronous bits in there, the execution of that pipeline chain will handle that for you. So it handles your asynchronous and synchronous processing. So you don't necessarily have to pollute a bunch of pure functions that look like, oh, if you're in JavaScript world, I'm gonna use JavaScript because that's probably what most people are familiar with at the least, is you've got your promises. I've got, if I have a promise, if I have a pure function that I need to do on that data, I still need to wrap that in a then and do that after if I get a promise back. I have to then unbox the promise or the result or the either monad or things like that. I have to unbox that, do a map on that function of that and then transform that going through that as well. So I start to get contaminated once you get into asynchronous world. This allows you to hide that away because the execution takes care of it for you, not the data definition. Uh, so I kind of covered it already, but how do they work at a high level? They run forward calling enter function, the enter function on all interceptors. If it's not there, we treat it as identity. It doesn't transform the context. The enter function, if it does, you think of the enter function as just another function that takes, a, again, it takes a context, which is a map, does a transformation on it, and returns it back to you. And then it either returns it back to you in a asynchronous mechanism, like a, like a future or, or something, or just as the data. And then it goes through, after it goes through the whole chain, it will go through, it builds up a stack of everything it's called before. And so it, as you have a queue of things to work. As it runs through that queue, it starts to put it on a stack of things that you're going to go back and revisit and say, hey, do any of these have a leave function? So if I got through this completely fine, I'm going to call the leave function. This is my chance to clean up resources. If I get into an error case, if something throws an error, it jumps tracks and starts to run it through an error case in this. And if the error is resolved, 
it usually jumps back to the lead because like, hey, I handled this error. I'm not going to proceed any further, but I'm out of bad state and I can go back into a nice leave path because I've handled the error. Uh, and so you call leave on the remaining interceptors. And again, errors are data. You have your error as a data piece as well. So you can inspect that error. You treat that error as data as well because you have the exception. You have the error. It gets added to the context and you can inspect it. You can look at that without consuming it, without dirtying it. And you say, do I have this? Am I? Is this something I can do? Usually if you try and catch something, you're like, oh, I tried. I catch. I got to make sure I rethrow so I don't swallow. In this case, because the error is data, you can just be like, error. Eh, that's not something I can handle. Ignore. Just, re just return the context. Otherwise, I do my usual thing. So you don't actually have to worry about like, did I accidentally swallow it? Did I rethrow? And now I'm, did I rethrow when I should have wrapped? Should I, did I wrap when I should have rethrown? Am I going to contaminate my stack trace on this error based off how I handled it? You don't need to worry about that because it's just data. And in our, in the case of the library I'll demo that we did was if you don't do it, you just leave it there. If you handle it, you take that error off the context and say, look, yep. Error, no error on the context. I cleaned it up so nobody else needs to know about this error. And then it's just data as well. So we, the goal is that this all stuff is like, it's data everything. It's kind of beyond the data-oriented programming that Jonathan's book is about that I referenced in the beginning, where this is like data-driven programming. So we start to drive everything as data as well. So this is from Pedestal. This is one of their Doc, this is this is an image off their document. So you take the context map. You have a bunch of interceptors. These get put on. It goes through all of the enter chains. You now get a new context map back. That gets fed back through the leave chains, and you get a new result back. That is your context map. Does my highlight cursor show up for you, Claude? Thumbs up. Okay. So yeah. So we start with this map. Again, this map is immutable. Because we love immutable data, we don't actually modify the map. We need to make a copy of the map. This is immutable persistent data structure. So the context map comes here. We have the original map. We modify it and enter. It gets a new map. There's a new copy here that flows through this. And it goes through each stage. And this down here is the same thing. It's just showing the routing that now we go find anything, any leaves that are there and we return back and we get our context map back out. And as I said, if this thing returns something asynchronous here, the executor will sit and wait and block on that for you. And this interceptor doesn't have to know it. It just takes the context map as data. I like to think of as Dagwood sandwiches because that diagram is too neat for code that we write in the, in the modern world. And they're usually nice and messy. So the way I make a sandwich is I throw a bunch of stuff on and it's not evenly balanced. It's not, it's not spread out. I may be missing tomatoes on one side. I may be missing pickles on another. Uh, so I use the metaphor of a Dagwood sandwich and be, also because I have kids and younger kids at that, I pictured a caterpillar eating through that sandwich. So you have that, you have that exceptionally hungry caterpillar that's very voracious and it eats through, in some cases, there may not actually be anything on an entry channel. It goes through, keeps going through. You may have a bunch of places where there's nothing on one side of that. So it eats its way all the way down, goes over, starts eating its way back up. And the other metaphor is if that caterpillar starts to eat, get into digestion, it jumps to the outside and starts nibbling the crust to, to really abuse the metaphor. And try it takes a little bit bits and nibbles until it gets good. And you're either gonna have a sick caterpillar that's represented, and you know that it's a sick caterpillar because you're like, I got this back, there's an error on it, it tells me exactly what went wrong, where, and I see so, a lot of the history. Or by the time I got it, my context map has turned into a, my beautiful butterfly from that basic caterpillar that I had because we went through that data transformation pipe. When might you not need them? Synchronous. You can get away with a threading macro, transducer, comp, whatever, just a regular map that in Haskell or some of these other languages that compose themselves that give you the ability to run through this 
run through your sequence one time because it's a uh, it's a functor, so it composes and the language takes care of it for you. So if it's synchronous, you really don't need this. There's no error. There's no resource cleanup. You don't really like it doesn't get you a lot of stuff. You can just take advantage of your basic pipeline threading operator, your basic pipe operator, your compose. Async. If you have no resource cleanup, if everything you're doing is just async and you can kind of just do promise thens and you don't have to worry about like, well, I initialized the database query or I also opened up Redis or I tried to send something else off. Uh, in one case at work, I put a interceptor in and one of the benefits of why we did this was to decouple it from a request response model that a bunch of things happened, but we had to, we had a, Reconciler, so lost jobs. So we have transactions. So a missed transaction, we go and find missed transactions. So it has to go through that lambda, looks at the database, marks those things as caught, as being detected, says, okay, yes, we found them. And then we'll go drop a message in the SQS queue. The catch is what we did is that SQS message may fail. So we can mark things as success in the database. SQS goes down. We can't publish the SQS, we get an error back. What I did was by having the interceptors, it allowed me to do a little bit of a retry for the SQS, but doing some other advanced stuff that I did. But also just, if I get an error back in my, in my error handler, I essentially roll back that transaction by marking it as undetected. So I go through optimistically mark it as detected. After it goes through and hits an SQS queue, and that message call that call to publish to a message is success, I consider it good. But if there's an error that I need to account for, it comes through and pulls it back in. So that's one of the things when you have asynchronous, but you also have resource cleanup that you kind of need to tie together, it helps with that. But if you just can go through and it's asynchronous, and then everything else is just a bunch of asynchronous stuff and you don't really care about the handlers and you just have one nested like, Oh, at the end, this thing failed. Sorry. I can show you a 500 error or something, and I don't really need to do any. Don't necessarily need them. Uh, you don't need dynamic execution paths. You don't need phased error handling, where things are happening at different places, and other error handling may throw error. Hand like, I've got a promise catch, and that promise catch can throw an error. And now what happens to that thing, and how does that affect the chain and, and handle that? And again, as I mentioned, we'd have no nested resource cleanup, which was that example of the transaction across multiple databases, if you will. So I got to mark this in one database. I got to make sure it happens in both. And if it, they both don't happen, I've got to handle cleaning that up one way or another. Uh, so you think, it, so the goal is we think of the computation pipeline as data. Our control flow is data. What we outline is here's the data definition of our control flow. And again, it's just data. It's all data. We could, you can serialize it because it's data. So if you want to debug, you can serialize, like we've done this on some of the, one of the lambdas. I had some enhanced debugging I turned on that says at every step, if you turn this on, go add a dump of that context. And you can see everything that it's gone through so far, everything it thinks it's going to go through at this point and a bunch of different stuff. It's data. If you did it right, you could potentially have all that encapsulated, serialized out, picked back up, and actually try and run it on another computer because it's just data. If you do your serialization and your context of execution right, again, how you would how you'd go fetch things like database connections if you're doing something like that, it takes some stuff. But if it's just some basic transformations, this pipeline is data. And if it fails along the way, if you can capture that where it fails, and if something goes wrong, you get that data back. And it kind of gives you your time tra traveling debugger you see with Elm that I know Richard Feldman has talked about in some of these past groups and various other things that you can go and even React and Redux if you do like so Redux sagas, you can start to capture these things as like, this is all data. And I can go back and forth and look at the transformation of the data through these various steps. It's a computation, and again, because it's data, same way you can think of it as comp, you can think of it as a fold L of apply. So it's a reduce. And instead of a list of 
items in a list of numbers I wanted to sum together. I take a starting value and I reduce over each one of those items, but I apply that function to that data, get a new output, and that gets fed into the next function. Because it's, and we think about it as, it's discrete stages, it's computation code. If it's not fancy, you can write a promise chain or you can write a fold if you want to as a reduce. Instead of doing a map or whatever, you could do a map, uh, X dot map dot map dot map dot map dot map. You could write that as a reduce where your reducing function is map against the list of the functions you want. It's general list manipulation. This is defined as a sequence. You can concatenate pipelines. If you have one pipeline here, this is your pipeline. You have another pipeline, you can put them together. What a common pattern is, is you have baseline setup pipelines. If I handle an HTTP request, I've got a pipeline that's my base pipeline for like my base initializer. Get things started, get things hydrated at the base functionality. And then in my specific handler, I've got a pipeline for my specific handler. So because they're data, I can compose these things together. I can take things out. I can filter, I can reduce, I can drop if they're not explicit. One of the other nice things that to me is the locality of processing. Because we define each interceptor as a map and it's got an enter, a leave, and an error, or it's got some combination of all three of those things, you see your enter by your leave. You see your enter by your error. Your error handling your and your cleanup and your resource cleanup, if you do resource openings, are all together. You don't have it at the top of your file for setting up a global variable that lives somewhere, you can put it somewhere else. Uh, your, your initialization writes to that variable in a different file, your leave gets put in, gets moved and refactored to somewhere else. You don't realize where these things are. Because we outlined this data, you've got a locality in your code, in your mind of the things that go together. This interceptor, here is the stuff bundled together that says, here's how I, do my setup, here's how I do my teardown, and here's how I do my error handling. And those are all bundled together. Uh, the other catch that's nice, because it's data and the context map is data, is I can put something on the context map and I don't have to stick it in global mutable state. I can use the context map as my state monad and for a request for a processing pipeline, I can stick my database resource in there into the context on my enter and let the leave and the error pick that out from the context and have that carried around through the execution with it. And it can kind of just sneak that into a map because back to the data oriented programming, they're open maps. You look, you pull out the things you need and you don't filter them down to only the things you want. You say, hey, if somebody else stuck it, something in here, that's great, I don't care. I only need these three fields. I pull things out that I know about, I operate on that, and I update keys that I know about, anything else that's in there, it doesn't matter. So I can have a, I can have something that puts in the database connection or database connection pool with the database connection that says, okay, by the time I get to resource cleanup, I'm going to re-give that connection back to the connection pool and it gets handled. And I see it, it all goes together. So if I'm looking at this thing, I'm like, wait, you're pulling, you've got an enter here that pulls a resource. Where's your cleanup? Why aren't you cleaning this up? You're, you're opening a file here. You're passing that file through to be processed because it's too big to actually open and use this data. So you're passing the handler, but why don't you have your handler clean up here? You see those things grouped together in the code in a mind and it kind of puts that as like, ooh, you missed this part. Uh, but it is data so, and because of these things, order does matter. There are some things that can be moved around, but if you're doing setup, you can't, you have to have your database connection pool initialized and set up and hydrated before you actually try using it. It's not like you can just throw it willy nilly in the comp, but again, you can't do that in your standard threading pipeline composition either. It's these things flow through in a way and if I expect keys here in one spot, they better have been set up in another spot. 
but it's also the computations. So that's the computation. That's the processing definition of data. It's also the computation state is data. And so it's just a map. It's all just a map. It's an open hash table. We don't care about refining and constricting these types that we want. These are known keys. We have a canonical data location. If I put my database in there, I can say, hey, my database is going in this place. If I need to get a user and hydrate a user for a request, because we're going to do some user after I've authenticated that user, and if we need to know who that user is, I can hydrate that user and then let the other places be pull that user that they need to access if they need to access it as data now, because I've put it in a known place with a canonical key that says, this is my current user, or this is my session user, and this is however you need to. So you can hydrate the data. And in a lot of cases, you can hydrate by prod as by default. I can set things up in a prod mode. But because it's data, I can swap out that interceptor in a execution context, or only take part the second half of the chain that after the database is set up, I can put a shim in there that will give me a fake database connection or fake database uh, for local connection versus the prod connection or how do some other setup, it's data. I can do a update in to a map. I can put a new value in at a key because I know where that key is. So I can swap out implementations if I want. I can kind of use it as a dependency injection framework because if this user is there in on this known key, it doesn't matter if I get that user from a database that uses it from read from a file on my system, it's just a dumbed down user that's specified as a test or just test data or just even a basic double with just the things I need. I can swap that stuff in. And then it's the functions. I can put functions in there. I can partially apply functions or give a wrapper function that gives me a test implementation that gives me an interface. And in prod, it can be a real thing. But because functions are data, I can put functions in under keys too that those functions can be invoked at a later time. Hey, you need to go look up, you need to go update this transaction. You need to go send an SQS message. How do I send an SQS message? I don't know. I just have an SQS message send function that takes a message in a format that I need. And that goes on as a key. That can be hydrated up in any different number of ways. And it can be hydrated up once at the system level and then just put in on the bootstrapping of this or in a test, it's like in a test, I'm just gonna, I might bootstrap that high, I might bootstrap the normal one. And before I use it on my test, I'm just gonna update the context map myself with what I need to do before it gets used. And so it's just data. And that's one of those things that's, that's also nice about this that I wanna share and see how other people think about this thing and what, what the variants on this are in other languages. Sorry. Um my own ignorance. What do you mean by hydrating? Uh, if you have a user and you need to get that user from the database or you need to go get that user from somewhere else. If you have something that you have to load up or you've got like, I, I give you a user ID. How do I get that data, right? Or in your case, when you're doing some of your sociology, you may have your giant CSV that you actually read from when you're going to run your, when you're running everything for your real data. But you might hydrate a subset of just like, here's a couple of hundred rows that I'm going to hydrate for testing that I want to just like, I want to test a small little function. I can hydrate the data in different manners. And that's kind of like, I've got this abstract concept of data, but how do I get that really populated or give me something that can give me a fully populated thing when I need it and be able to open that up. And that's kind of what the idea of hydrating data is. It's you think of that in that future, that future science fiction food, like here's your little piece and you like drop your little drops of water and all of a sudden it's like, here's your massive data that you really want. But how you get that from gets to be abstracted because all I care is I just know I'm going to look in the key under this map and it's going to be there. And I don't care how it got there. I know by the time I need to use it, it's there. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop presenting real quick because my got, I forgot to turn flux off or iris off and it, I'm afraid it might be making your screen dark too.
taking the blue out. So I'm making sure it's, I don't want to. Uh, so tips for defining them. Keep them small and focused. You execute a thing, you fetch a thing, you do your action. That's distinct from the computation of the, either using that thing or computing data that will help you get that thing later. So it allows you to keep your, again, your data separate from your calculations, separate from your actions. If I need to do something, I can treat my action as data and I can hydrate in a way and it doesn't, it's abstracted to me because that that's just a function I can call because that's data. Uh, if you have namespace keywords, that's even better. Uh, but use canonical keywords. Namespace just means like, hey, I can stick something under my like database namespace for this context map and kind of hide it away that it doesn't exist. And you don't even think about it because you're in your own little nice playground world. Uh, one case of this is the interceptor libraries in a lot of cases use namespace keywords for their keywords that they use because the execution of that interceptor chain, as I mentioned, there's a queue and a stack that gets kind of managed and visualized. There's actually a queue and a stack put on the context that you can see. So you can see what the execution queue is that's still yet to be run and the context stack that you've built up of things that are going to be go through when you return. So the namespace keys kind of like help you to like put that away so you don't get collisions of that. But as long as you know this thing is where it's gonna go and you know like it's always gonna be found in this spot, those are one of the things. So you know you add it to a known place or you look in a known place for your data if you need it. You use them for management of resources and or sets up the resource. The leave and the error cleans it up. And then you can actually, as I mentioned before, that's locality in code, locality in mind. You see your cleanup and your teardown right together near the setup. It's not like, sometimes if you've written tests, you're like, here's my setup, here's all my tests, and then here's my teardown. And if you do it that way, you realize, ooh, I forgot to tear down resources because it's not right at, like usually people try and put their setup and teardown right by each other. So they see that I've got the setup, I need to make sure I do the teardown and don't forget it. Uh, in your context, think thread local. It may be global, but you try and treat it as thread local. And if you're going to use your shared resources, you want to think of them as, as thread local so you don't have it. So it's like if you have a database connection pool, that's not thread local, but you want to think about like as I use the database connection pool, that is global mutable state but I want that to be looked like as thread local. So maybe I wrap it in my enter so I can have stuff that knows how to tear it down so it looks like it's local in this context or it looks like it's local to everybody else that they just have a database connection instead of having to worry about the global view. And then because they're maps for your interceptors, add a name key. Usually interceptors are open maps or open records. So it's helpful just to add a name key. So when you're looking at things, you can actually see details about what that map is and that what that map has. And you can see a name. It's like, oh, I'm at this phase of the processing pipeline. Uh, so this was the library we made. We made it Papillon, as I mentioned. It turns your beautiful, mutable, ugly caterpillar of mutable state into a beautiful butterfly of execution. Uh, why did we do this? As I mentioned, at guaranteed rate when we were looking at this, we're on lambdas. Lambdas don't, and we're on SQS lambdas that are that get triggered. So in a lot of cases, they're not actually operating on a request response model. Uh, pedestal interceptors need the whole pedestal setup. Safari so uses a request response model. Again, we're Q-driven. We're on JS, we're in JS, no JS world because we're using closure script for this. Uh, they're a niche pattern. I wanted to put another, and we kind of wanted to talk about, and I see Chris joined. Chris was our manager at the time who kind of gave, gave feedback. As we were doing this, we talked about that. And Andrew, Chris, and I were talking about this. We're like, this is something that's not as well known as it seems like it's useful. 
And there's a couple of variations, but we wanted to kind of give another thing and just kind of restart that conversation in the closure community and just see a variation on it and just see what things would be good. Because we, I, we when we were talking about this, we stole different ideas and it's a weird hodgepodge of ideas from Pedestal and Safari and some of these other posts I recommend, I mentioned earlier in the thing. So it's like, here's another take on it. Maybe this is good. Maybe this is bad. Here's another, just here's another approach to try. Uh, and we wanted a small core with some of these other things. It's like, oh, you're going to get this logging library. You're going to get this. We wanted to try and treat as much of that stuff as add on, bolt on as you would do. So you could add your logging functions to the context. You could add your logger to the context. So we don't bake in opinions about how this works. Uh, so this was just the features. We took it away from the direct request response model. If you're familiar with Clojure, we used read port. So channels, and there's a bunch of other things that are there. If you're familiar with Clojure, we have the reduce. Uh, so in Clojure, and again, I would love to find out how many other languages do this. Closure has a concept of reduced. So if you're doing a reduction through reduce or transducers, you can call reduced and give a reduced value. And it knows that I may have 100 items to run through. But if by the time I get to six, I decide I'm done, I can return a already reduced value. And it will stop processing of that reduction, that reduce and that reduction pipeline. So if there's numbers one through 100, I get to six. In many cases, what I've seen reduce is you have to have a check yourself in each one of those reducing functions that say, okay, I'm still gonna run seven through 100, but I've got to check and see, do I need to actually do anything? Closure has this idea of reduced, which is nice. And I'd love to see other languages if they've done it, but you can say, hey, this thing's reduced. I'm telling you I'm done. So if you get if you have more stuff to do, doesn't matter. Don't worry. I'm done. There's nothing to do here. So we kind of took that pattern as well. And then they're just maps. Uh, implications. Uh, call it things that may blow some mind and some feet. These are the foot guns, foot bazookas, uh, live grenades. If if you're aware of it and you're cautious enough. You got your runtime path, it's data. You can go in and if you look at your context, I can actually go through and decide, I'm gonna add more stuff or I'm gonna go take, if I have names on these things, I can go take my take my queue, modify my queue by going finding things with this name or go take these things out of the queue, take it, update the queue, continue on. And I've now just dynamically changed my execution strategy. You can do aspect oriented style. I have, like, I've got an example I'll show you in a demo where you turn on enhanced debugging. It will take everything in the queue after that and interleave a new interceptor that just does debugging and prints out that queue and prints out the context at that point. Because it says, I'm going to take your original one. And in between each of these, I'm going to interleave another interceptor that does logging for you. Uh, branching. I get to a spot. An interceptor may decide it's a, it's terminated. Dude, this is my default workflow, but now I fork off. And that interceptor may decide, hey, once I've got to the state, which route do I take? I go add, I can go add more or or remove more interceptors dynamically based off where I am. I've come to a fork in the road. I code up to that fork. And then that, at that point of the fork, it makes a decision that says, now. Now I'm going to tell, tell you at this point whether I need to go left or right on the port. Again, advanced stuff because it's all data that it gets you. But again, you can, if you're not careful, you can shoot your foot off. Uh, nested context, because we decoupled this from request response, you can have interceptor execution running inside of interceptor execution. You can create yourself a new context data. Maybe you pluck out some of the existing keys that you already had. Same way you can fork off promises or futures. You can do, hey, I've got this context data. Go run some other context, and then I'll collect those results out, pull out from some appropriate keys, and stick those in, and then continue on. Yeah, so you can kind of do a fork join if you want to. End condition systems. This is one of my favorites. 
just because it's so out there and it's so much of a Lisp idea. If you're familiar with common Lisp, you don't have exceptions in a lot of cases. You have a condition system. So what happens is you can plug in errors. And if you've seen a common list, there's examples floating out there of like the common list debugger. When you get an error by default in common list, it throws you into a debugger window. It says, hey, I hit this. What do you want to do? You can actually go in common list. You can go rechange your code. And you can actually restart from a pre previous spot and go to retry execution. You Because your processing queue is data, I've got some examples and I, I'm in the library, uh, might be able to get to them where, hey, if I get, I could actually implement a HTTP failure and implement a circuit breaker or exponential back off by modifying the queue and doing manual retries by trying, by modifying the execution path so many times by raising some extra, extra stuff up a signal because I have access to the whole stack, whole history and execution context, you can start to implement something that looks like a condition signal where you can raise a condition, you can signal something to respond to and have something that handles and changes your execution flow dynamically at runtime. Uh, I do have a demo. I'm not sure where we are on time, Claude, how much we want to give into the demo. If we want we're, to take questions first. I think we're... I think, yeah, um, maybe that would be a good chance for um, if there are any pressing questions right now, but I want to see the demo. Anybody have any questions? I, I did have a question, but maybe it will be answered by the demo, um, but but maybe I could ask it and you can address it in the demo. So what what stops you from basically having each interceptor basically taking the enter function? And the leave function, and just breaking it into two interceptors, right? And then, and then just having one interceptor has the old enter, and it has identity for leave, and the other interceptor has the identity for enter, and then, and then leave. I mean, what what problem does that solve in a sense? Does that make sense? There is nothing that prevents you from doing that. If that's how you decide that it makes sense to organize the code. It may make sense to do that. So there may be some generic error handling, but at a certain point, some of that idea is like, hey, if I've got a database set up or if I've got file handlers that I'm doing, not just fetching from a database, but if I have something that I need to, like it's kind of that idea of putting them together locally, conceptually as well, right? So I can right. see in my mind kind of the way at the, where I got, I kind of touched on this was at least the way I like to structure tests when I write tests, if I have setup and teardown, I like to put the setup and teardown together instead of separate them off because I like that locality in there and that presence in there together. So if, if that's something you're, you like, it makes sense to bundle them up and create them as a single piece of process also may be helpful if you're, wanting to reuse it because then you just add that one interceptor and that interceptor if it's shared across different parts of a code base or different handlers like if you need a hydrated user kind of thing and you need to close out something too that can be reused ad hoc <laughs> like that can be reused, be reused ad hoc as is instead of having to make sure you get both pieces into your pipeline yeah, I guess I, my my mental model of middleware is, is like a queue, right? It's like uh, first in, first out, right? It just you start and you do um, you have instruction one, it does it. Instruction two, maybe you jump out of the pipeline or something like that. And I'm trying to I'm trying to get a sense for what what advantages you have by treating things like a stack, like if it's if it's well, it's a little bit of both because in some in a number of middlewares you have a request handler and a response handler, right? Sure. And for so, me, the biggest good. I was going to say the the biggest difference I've experienced transitioning from middleware to the interceptor chain model is the composition that you get at runtime. So that dynamic composition bullet point that that Proctor mentioned is it 
it, it is game changing once you get comfortable with it. So with middleware, at least in the languages where I've used it, the composition is static. It's a closure, in fact. All right, so one piece of middleware is closing over another piece of middleware is closing over another piece of middleware. And the net result of that is one function that is statically at that point, uh, it, it's statically constructed and you can't, you know, and you're halfway through that stack of middleware, you can't change it. At best, you can uh, change directions and start coming out if you throw an exception, but you can't say, I wanna add something in between these two pieces of middleware when you're a third of the way through the middleware. That's just, that's, that's not something that middleware that I've worked with allows because it is a closure. It's a single function. And in fact, it, the debugging can be challenging with middleware because the closing over of a named function becomes somewhat obscured in call st in stack traces sometimes. But with interceptors, you have an actual data structure, a queue of the next interceptor to handle. And it's not just your language that says this function is calling this function. There's a there's an interceptor processing engine that says, well, this is the next thing on the queue and I'm gonna run it next. And therefore you have the ability to change that queue and have the interceptor processor engine change what it's going to do. Uh, again, it's the dynamic nature of interceptors where you can modify the queue of what's coming next. So you really are using the, the stack property. Where yes. You stack something, you can push something onto the stack and then it immediately gets popped off. So you're not like, when you push something onto a, a queue, when I think of a queue, I think of like a first in, first out kind of queue. I'm just Right. Uh, <clears throat> you can only push it onto the end of the queue and the, you get issues with termination of the um, termination of the process, right? Right, so yeah, the queue is, um, it's immutable, but because you're returning a new context, um, you can return a new queue that is the same as the previous queue, but with something new added on to the end, or it, it's actually um, a vector in a lot of implementations. So you could inter interleave like a debugger between every interceptor. So you, you, go, you go from a queue of 12 remaining interceptors to a queue of 24 remaining interceptors. And the debugger interceptor that gets injected between each one prints out the context to a console or something like that. So yeah, it's very, very malleable. It's not a static queue that you can't touch. And it's been predefined. It's, it's a queue that you could modify. It's the sequence of remaining interceptors or, and I posted this in the chat, a good example that I bumped into here recently working with interceptors is a model that says, um, we're gonna run through a, a chain of interceptors to process an inbound HTTP request. And we're gonna, at the, the very last interceptor on that chain is a router. And when the router detects that you've hit a route that is in fact a GraphQL route, it is going to stick a whole bunch of new interceptors on the end of the queue that weren't there initially because it was conditional based on the route that was hit. It's gonna stick a whole bunch more interceptors on the queue that can process the GraphQL request, parse it, decide which resolver to run, or which resolver is plural to run, that kind of thing. So it, it's, and it, that, that example could probably be taken a lot further to do like incremental routing. You had a, 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 a very hierarchical routing system. You could have one interceptor that pops off the first segment in the route and puts some interceptors on the chain to deal with all of the sub routes underneath that. But it's, it, the dynamic nature of interceptors is very different from middleware. And it's both a queue and a stack. So right. in a lot of the executors, you have your queue of things that you're going to work but you also have your stack of things that you've seen. And that's where some of this aspect oriented programming stuff comes in that I that I can see if I can get to demonstrate was you could put a interceptor on there. And then in my kind of 
condition system aspect going to decide was I put an interceptor that doesn't have an enter, exit, or leave, but it has another little piece of metadata, piece of data on that map that's talking about signal that because I've got my whole stack trace as a snapshot too of everything, well, my execution stack. I've got my execution queue of things I'm going and doing forward, but I've also can see my whole execution stack of everything I've already executed. So I can actually go consume that stack and pop myself up that stack without actually consuming it because that's an immutable data structure too. That's a persistent data structure. So I can keep looking at my stack, walking up that stack, consume the stack without actually consuming my execution stack because I've just create new copies every time I pop something off that execution stack. As long as I don't rewrite it back onto the context, I can run through that hundreds of times and consume it a hundred times if I need to keep looking through a bunch of scenarios. And I've got that as a data structure too. Can you all Would see the terminal? Okay. Are there any other questions people might have before I get into the demo? And feel free to stop me in the demo too, if you have other stuff. Well, I'm wondering, is it fair to characterize the interceptor pattern as basically a custom implementation of the call mechanism that allows you to just basically, uh, just to modify what's gonna be called next or as opposed to uh, what, you're, what Chris was saying earlier about middleware being where you uh, define it once and statically uh, define what's going to be called next from from the from the beginning. I've thought of it that way before. <laughs> I don't know if that if Proctor shares that as a good characterization, but I've definitely thought of it as a dispatch mechanism for a like a general processor, a logical processor. Yeah, I I think it depends on the implementation and how because a lot of them try and handle both sync and async. So there's that aspect, but you could cut that off, you could cut that aspect off. And if everything was just treated always as async world, or you knew you were never going to get into sync world, like you knew if you knew you were in the one world, you could cut that part out completely because hey, I never have to deal with asynchronous stuff. So I could actually treat it as that. And I talked with again, talking with Chris, talking with Andrew. At one point, and just Andrew brought it up again when I was just running things by him with this was like, again, is your data definition of execution flow? There are things where you can actually like, here's an execution graph that I want to do, kind of like a workflow state, state machine that you could essentially treat a state machine and try and rewrite that as an interceptor chain too, if you wanted in a, in a way. Now, again, do you take advantage of the you don't necessarily get a bunch of the advantage of the cleanup stuff that is part of what's appealing to the interceptors to me as well of just having that locality. But that's a personal thing of being able to see resource cleanup in an async world be tied mentally. So I can see like, Hey, we did this. We didn't do, we didn't do this. We didn't do the cleanup part of it. Uh, but yeah, I think that is one big primary aspect. I don't, you could probably do an interceptor with just that. I was, I think conduit is something similar from the Haskell world, but I'm not too familiar, but it sounds, it feels like that's almost a similar kind of thing. Or I was like, is it almost like a free monad too? But I'm not, I'm kind of iffy on some of the free monad kind of stuff too. Has anybody ever used fourth macros? There's some analogies I think in there as well, especially if you, um, uh, it's it's like a there's some aspects that remind me of a virtual machine with a with a uh, program counter that points you know the queue is the next instruction but it's obviously an entire interceptor not a single instruction and you have the ability to modify the program as it's running fourth was coming to mind when you yeah. were describing this 
I think one big piece to it is the fact that like some of the flexibility of it is difficult to really wrap your head around until you start playing around with them. Um, because like there's certain aspects of it where if you think about it purely from the standpoint of only knowing or being familiar with um, middleware and closure and like closing around functions like what Chris Cyrus was mentioning. It is very similar, but the flexibility that you gain by decoupling those pieces out and treat it as the execution of a, of like a sequence. Uh, it, it, it's one of those mind bending things where once you start to grasp it and wrap your head around it, it's like, oh, wow, this is actually pretty simple, but really powerful. So here is, I showed a little bit of this a couple months ago when we were at the user group and they were talking I should, at the end. Yes, this code may look vaguely familiar because this is what I was showing off with the conversation about a REPL. Uh, when we were talking about the REPLs versus baby REPLs and how OKMOL had, has a nice REPL thing too. So this is an interceptor. So def. Uh, def Def is closures for defining something. So define one X and it's a map. It's got name. These are just keywords. So it's got a keyword for the name and then it enter as a function. It takes a context and just takes that context associates, which is essentially add to with key number, put one in the map. So I can define that interceptor. And then what I just do is I just, this is my interceptor chain right here. It is just one interceptor that is the one IX and I can call execute on, I call execute on it. And I get the result back. So go is the async, go is closures, go routines, CSP, continuation style processing mechanism, uh, similar to go if you looked at go. So goes it, you can also think of go like, async and this as the tape which is kind of like an await in the jo modern javascript uh how's the font do i need to blow it up at all looks good to me okay i tried to get it it's in a little tiny for me but i can i can i can squint better Did you change anything? <laughs> uh, bumped it up a couple. Bumped it up a couple. Okay. Uh, yeah. So to me, it's a four. I got a four K monitor, so I'm just. It's like it's always hard to tell what the right font size is for everybody. Uh, so here's another one. Double number. So this one does update of that value. So it looks in the key number, and we'll just take whatever value it gets out of that and just doubles it. I define that thing, and then here's my, this is my new interceptor chain, is one with the double number. And IX is just interceptor, uh, shorthand. There's a couple of ways people talk about enclosure. There's things like transducers and other kinds of things that get this like two letter, ac little two letter acronym abbreviation for this thing. So IX was just kind of the, our way of saying this thing is an interceptor. So, uh, a nice so convention. We, so, we just have that as a convention. And then, what you see here, this is the result. So, what you can see here is we have the queue, the queue is empty, and we have the stack. The stack is empty, and we get back the number two because we started with something that just put one in, and then this doubled it. Uh, so I've got a trace function. So this one just says, hey, make trace, like I'm in make trace interceptor for an enter message, a leave message, and an error. And it just does a printing out and returns the context un undone. So I can, because this is data, I can have a make trace interceptor with a entering message of entering, a leaving message of leaving, leaving, and an error message of error with a giant 
emoji X, red X. And I have that interceptor. I make a sequence of that interceptor by calling repeat. So this is a lazy, unterminating sequence of that interceptor. I now have my standard interceptor chain, one double and double. I can enter because this is just data. I have these two different interleaving. I have these two different interceptor sequences. One's an infinite sequence. One's a sequence of three. I can interleave those two. So if I were just to do this, if I were just to run this part, there we go. I ran the whole thing. So I can see I have my make trace interceptor. I have my one interceptor. I have my make trace. I have my double. I have my make trace. I have my double. So I'm now able to interleave these things through because it's just data. So I can have my default interceptor chain here. That's what I want to do. And I can just say, hey, it's data. Go munch this, go munch the sequence before I even do anything. And I execute it. So I can execute it. And if we go here, you can say, here's the here's the output. So make trace entering. Here's the queue. And we can see a queue. So it's got one IX, make trace IX double number, make trace, double number. And then I can see this stack. I've already executed one make trace here. So I see my stack build up. And I can see that here's another one. And I go through and it's now double number, make trace, double number, make trace. And I can see here's my stack. And I can see what my stack looks like. So it's make trace, one, make trace. I now have a number on there and I can go through and I can start to see, again, this output is the context and that context is data. And that's why I said, because it's just data, if you have the right thing, you could potentially hydrate this back in. Again, you'd have to pull it out and update the, you'd have to have a hydration piece to do it, to hydrate something else within that, like a hydrate interceptor that took an existing sequence and would, stick things on, but you could actually manipulate and munge this because it is data. And then we get to the point where the queue is empty. And then you see the stack starts getting smaller and we start popping things off the stack. And we can see at, well, at this point, we get the stack is empty. And here's the number four, because we doubled it. We took one and we doubled it twice. So starts to, because these are all interceptors, uh, more complex tracing stuff. Uh, I've got some describe interceptors. So if it's got a name, it uses the name. Yeah, otherwise, it just uses the interceptor and prints it out. I create a new queue of the pretties, prettified versions. I will go prettify keys. I can do some context stuff. I give a new, con uh, so I can prettify the context. So instead of the, having the real context and I'm messing with the real context, I've got the context, I've got the queue, I've got the stack, I've got everything else. I can go munge this for printing, not worry about contaminating the real stack and just do some data manipulation on the interceptor itself and get that. Uh, are we in debug mode? Sure, we're in debug mode. So I can do something like with tracing. If we're in debug mode, we're going to interleave the trace interceptor. Otherwise, it's just the interceptor chain that we get in. So I can kind of hide this thing and say, here's my interceptor chain. I can turn on with tracing and I can execute it. So now, because I've given all these things name, the prettified version says, hey, here's the names of these things in the queue. And here's the names of them in the stack and I don't see everything else. And you can start to see the stages of where they are. Also, I can redefine debug to be false. And I do with tracing. And I drop all that tracing because debug's not on. So it actually just only ever, it gives me just the original sequence and doesn't, doesn't modify that sequence. And then this is just showing that these work, that it works for asynchronous stuff. 
So in this case, Go returns a channel, which is the abstraction of asynchronous computation that we use. And so I can do one with some asynchronous doubling and it works for asynchronous stuff. And I can mix synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, just a different way of, if you remember, Go, this is just some closure minutia. Go returns a channel by itself, but you could also just return another channel. So if you have a channel, it'd be like creating a new promise versus adding, resolving an existing promise. Uh, so you, I can create a promise, I can return that promise and let something asynchronously go put something in. it. So I can do some other async, another version of asynchronous squaring the number. And so I can do a couple variations, have a bunch of async processing where I'm doubling, squaring, doubling and squaring and get things through. Uh, this is the reduce, this is the early exit. This is what I was talking about. So there is a function called reduced enclosure that will stop a stop a reduce function in the middle of that pipeline. So we cribbed that based off Eric Norman's kind of blog post on interceptors and said, I actually like that idea. So we can actually put an interceptor and it could decide I've hit a point where I'm done. Just tell them I'm done instead of actually like having to go modify the chain myself. So it gives a kind of an easy way to, in a safer way of saying, instead of you having to modify the queue and go clear everything out on the queue and make sure you do that right, just call reduced and you don't have to worry about that and we'll just stop execution for you. So here we can say with tracing, that's one and reduced. And then we have double square, double square. And if I run that, we can see it's just one. Oh, and I turned off debug. Debug back to three. So yeah, so this is my whole pipeline. So if we look at the with tracing, you can see there's a bunch of interceptors there. But all it did when it executed was it had all these interceptors, it hit enter, it would hit reduced. And then said, oh, now I'm going back and I'm hitting stage leave. So I'm done. There's nothing else to do here. Uh, just some example of error handling. So if I just have generic error handling, which I may do for a web request or something else, I may need to catch errors and then look at those errors and turn those into a 500 uh, because this it's the generic error. So you can have an error handler that has an error that just, again, this one just throws. And you can see that if we don't do any error handling, we get back and we're at the stack and we get the error. So we have the error in the P and then you can see that, hey, here's this stack trace, oh no's. So that's an illustration, that stack trace of a surprise if you're used to middleware, is that the stack trace isn't just your named interceptors. It's also the interceptor chain execution engines stack trace mixed in there. It could be a little disconcerting to see that, but it's a small price to pay. Yeah, right here, the Papillon enter trace yeah. age. Yeah. But what you see uh, it's is, a good, oh, go ahead, Chris. I was gonna say it's it, it it's an artifact of having an um, an explicit external execution engine instead of just simple composition of functions. And what you can see is here we had error right right before, and we had the queue, but we never actually did anything else because the next thing that happened was the stage of error. So as soon as we hit that error, we just abort and we get out and we continue, we'll walk up that path. Uh, so then we have, so this is what I was saying is in this case, it may be, hey, we're gonna return, we don't want to 
throw an exception, we want to return a 500 error to a user. If we get a 500 error, we have a default error handler that says, hey, handling the error, it's done, return 500, like put a 500 response on the contact. But by signaling that we've resolved it, we need to remove the error from the context as well. So that's our signal. So by having this error on the context, as I mentioned before, it allows anything who doesn't handle it or anything who could potentially handle an error, inspect that error because they have the error in the context. They, that error is now data and they can expect it. So this one will resolve it and take it away and signify that I have handled it by removing it from it. So we add the resolving error handler first. Oh. So here we add that first because it needs to go in and essentially be one of the last things on the stack as it executes. If we threw the error for, if we had the error before, we throw the error with nothing pushed onto the stack that knows how to handle it. So we put it on the queue at the very beginning. We have our resolving error handler. And then we can say, hey, here it is. And then we get our output of handling error. And now we see we back into leave. So we've handled the error and we flow back through the leave route. Uh, so this one was things like, hey, this is a resource. We have an error handler. And again, this one doesn't actually resolve any, this one doesn't resolve the errors, but it has some resource cleanup to do. So faking out things, we are gonna put a DB connection in a, the context. When we come through the error path, and this should be in, this should also be in leave, but just to show the reference, we don't know how to error the handle, but we need to clean up. We made a mess, we gotta clean up after ourselves with the DB so we don't leak that connection. Uh, so clean up. So this is our finally style cleanup. We open a D a bit, and then this, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the one that does both. So this is a list pattern, let over Lambda, let FN lets us define a function cleanup that is scoped and only visible to this. Uh, so this is just like saying, Hey, we've got a cleanup function. We want to use the same cleanup function in our leave and our error. We can define it via closure. So this is like defining a closure that would return that function as well. Uh, so our cleanup does it's cleanup, pick up, put away. Uh, anybody with young kids will probably pick up on that. But then we dissociate the context and we do that same thing for both error and leave. Uh, this one. They don't have to resolve it. They could do something else. Uh, so on error, we're going to turn this thing from a, if it's one, we're going to turn it into this, into the string O and E. Otherwise, we're going to stringify that value of one. So again, it doesn't have to handle. It could do whatever you need to do on an error handle. So we have, we have our trace stuff. We have one. We have a resource cleanup one, we have our transforming one, and we do throw an error. So if we go up here a little bit, this gets long. But we can see we have our enter, we open a DB connection, we have the DB connection on the context now. We have our DB connection. We get a we get to our error. Oh, we throw the error, we're at the error IX, so it throws. We're here, oh no's. We've got our number is still as one because it's logging. We're not handling the error, but we're gonna transform it. So we turn that number from the value one to the string one. And then we go through and still has the database connection. And this thing doesn't have to, does know how to handle it, but it remo it's removed that DB connection from the context now. Uh, any questions at this part? I think that's... That was a fire hose. Yeah, this is a fire hose. 
So I'll pause here because most of this stuff is just showing synchronous and asynchronous up until about here. Yeah, a lot of those other ones could be summed up with the the statement that it allows you to interleave synchronous and asynchronous operations. This one here is one of the, of if the number comes in and that's even, we're done, reduced. No more processing. So we're going to take the context and we're going to make the context reduced. Otherwise, we do the context. So this is our way of doing exit earlies. So numbers two, we're done when even, it's done. If the number comes in as three, it's not done, it's not even. So we double it again and we get 18. So this is our way of essentially early exits. So we still have more, so this done when even, we still have more interceptors later in that inter execution chain but we here by returning a reduced context say, I'm going to tell this is my way of signaling to the executor that stop, start returning, we're done processing this thing. Uh, but it's also not an error. So we just finished our work. The opposite is we can do things like ensure even. If we go to a point where it's even, then we just have the context. If it is not even, we're gonna add some more interceptors on, and this is what Chris was talking about with like the uh, GraphQL route handler. If we get to this point and this condition matches, it's this path. Otherwise, go add one, two, three, go add three more interceptors to process to the chain. So we are running in the middle of this execution pipeline, and we are now adding more work to be done because we realized I got to this point and this number is not even, or this is a special kind of handler uh, that we need to invoke. So we can now modify this queue in flight. Okay, I've got a few questions. I don't, I don't know that I'll ask them all, um, but um, one just on the reduced, how do you know that you have a reduced context versus a non-reduced context? Uh, so reduced, so there is a, there is a predicate that Pojo has of reduced and you can do, so if you give it a reduced, you can give a, it's, it's a little wrapper function, kind of monadic of saying, hey, is this thing reduced or unreduced? And so I can just give it a reduced value and it knows how to box it up and I can just check, is this thing reduced or not? So it's not a flag added to the map. It's... It's a function you call on that context. So you return a reduced context. Okay. So it, again, it's like it's metadata, little... like metadata on the context. Yeah, one tip, like a really common spot that you might see that is if you're running a reduce operation, like map filter reduce, that sort of reduce operation. Um, calling reduced after a certain point in the reducing function will add metadata, like in a sense, metadata to the the values in play or like the collection in play to say, okay, I'm done, stop it. And then the reduce function itself will recognize that you've gotten to that point because of that, like, quote unquote, metadata flag. Okay, thanks. I mean, th this is depending upon closures, dynamic typing. Again, there may be other ways that there's like maybe there is a reduced monad kind of thing that things could fit in that knows how to stop doing it because uh, 
So if I've got this, I have a range of one to 10,000, I can reduce over that range. If my X is even, I can reduce my acume. I return a reduced acume. Otherwise I can just do my normal processing. So I can hit a point where I'm like, I'm done. And it knows how to early terminate and watch the steps. So if you, might have got more problems because I'm live coding. Would not be surprised if I mixed up. So I get, yeah, so my acume, I got them backwards, but one, two, three, three. So I went three steps through and got a four instead of going through the full 10,000 items on that thing. So it's a way to kind of give you an early Signify, signal an early termination and no further work needs to be done. Flip so that's too hard. Yeah. yeah. What it's actually doing underneath when you look at the internals of closure is it's creating like a new um, Java class of reduced with that value in there as the value for that reduced class. So in a sense, it's still using some sort of, sort of like type manipulation underneath, but on the surface, all you really see is the reduced or the reduce. The wrapper, I think that's, yeah, yeah. A, a detectable okay. wrapper. Yeah, 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 that's helpful. Yeah. That's, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll put a link to the underlying source code. Yeah, well, it's kind of like that. You could, you could, it could potentially be like a, And maybe monad, but like a reduced monad where it's like, oh, just the value or a reduced of this value, like right, just one or reduced of one kind of thing. And then you know that it's there. Uh, if you were going to try and adopt it in the type world and let your, every map function kind of be able to understand that when you're running over that kind of thing too. Uh, but yes, that's, that's a pre-done thing in Clojure. And so the idea of reduced was like, you can start once you get to intermediate closure, you might have encountered a reduced. So it's like, take advantage of that idea that like, reduced, I'm fully reduced. There's no other work. Because you kind of think of this as a, as I mentioned, you can almost think of the chain as a reduce over the steps of enter. And so by going over those things, you can kind of think of it that way and be like, oh, there's no more work to be done. I'm reduced, I'm done start the leave process to do my cleanup and resource deallocation and things like that. It's worth emphasizing again, if you didn't pick up from Proctor saying it earlier, that re reduced is really, it's a shorthand for clearing out the queue, which you could also do, right? I mean, there's no functional difference in signaling reduced versus emptying the queue. Yeah, to that end, like, the equivalent for just dropping the end of the queue would be like drop rest or drop second or drop cutter or whatever operation you prefer. The only the only benefit of reduced is it means you can get a little bit further without without having to get everybody to understand queue manipulation and and potentially screw up the queue. So it's a way of kind of easing you into the idea that like, oh, it's early termination, but now you want an early termination. Now you also have to understand how do I clear out a queue properly and not screw myself up and shoot myself in the foot because I'm not quite there yet. So that was one of the reasons of adding reduced, but it's, yeah, it's just more of like, I could just associate into the interceptor and, and empty essentially persistent queue which is the type under the covers, but. Yeah. Can you live code us an interceptor that does that instead of using reduced? So instead of that line right there on 330 that returns a reduced context by using reduced, it, sorry, it empties the queue. Is this up on line 330, can you change that? Yeah, I was rewriting it, so it could have them side by side. 
And then that would be that should be the same. You should I, want the error key. Right. I would have thought you would have oh, wanted sorry. the Auto, wrong yeah, autocomplete. <laughs> and do you, why does social instead of empty it? Uh could work either way. The reason I went to Soch, it could also be that's nil punning enclosure. Yeah. Uh it would also be if I update to empty. A Soch, it would need to be a just update to empty. It's a well, it's a persistent queue under the covers. That's all right. You can empty a persistent queue. Oh, I see. Uh, the function empty. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, there's a couple of different ways you could actually set it to a new persistent queue object, or you could up empty it and things like that. So yeah, these these two here are the equivalent of what reduce does under the covers. So it was uh, it was kind of the on ramp for our team of being new to interceptors that decided to add reduced in. So yeah, it's just saying okay, nope, it's. There's nothing there. Bye, right, John. I didn't catch him. Uh, yeah, in the, in the closure context, that reduced concept is shared with a fairly, you know, the fairly popular transducers idea. So that I could see how that could pay off. Yeah. Yeah, we spent a lot of time back and forth trying to figure out what's the path to least friction from an understanding standpoint. There was also the benefit of if they aren't reduced and they get exposed to reduced here, it helps them to understand transducers and other things because it's a common closure idea. Yeah, you said you had a list, Claude. What else you got? Uh, no, this was that was really helpful. Um, so in, I found it useful once you uh, distinguish this was fairly early on between the interceptor and the interceptor chain. And I'm, but I'm trying to understand um, where's the function that's defining the interceptor chain? Is it the go or is it the execute? Or is it? It is, it is just this vector, this list. It's literally yeah. just the list. Well, oh. it's just a vector of. In this case, it's the, se it's, it's now this sequence here because it's essentially the arguments are execute and an optional initial context map. So we can start a, our context map with number of three in it. And then the sequence of interceptors we want. In this case, it's this interceptor chain here interleaved with the trace interceptor that gives us our interceptor chain. Yeah, so that's so a chain it, of so six inter interceptors. Interleave is creating a new interceptor chain that that has the repeat trace inter interceptor in between each of those. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then what's and so execute wait a minute. Is is execute a function? Yes. I, what, what's actually executing the interceptor chain? That's that the execute, execute. function. That is the execute function. So that's the one. It it, it understands what yeah. to do with the enter, leave, and error uh, functions. Yep. So and, it, here's, and it's passing one to the next to the next to the next. Yep. So here's our base interceptors, and then we have so it's these three are our base interceptors, and then our interceptor chain. Now we've taken this interceptor sequence, which is an infinite sequence of trace interceptors, and interleaved it with the base interceptors. That's just closure sequence manipulation to build up the sequence that execute needs. Okay. And that's a really important point here. The fact that like, because this is defined in terms of standard closure data structures, like 
sequences or in this sense a vector that underneath it's really just a sequence um hash maps like keywords those sorts of things all of the standard data manipulation tools still apply so you can manipulate just that data just like you would normally manipulate other data and that that was one of the points made um when we had the presentation on data oriented programming um was that same just using standard closure functions and maps and and yep. yeah okay. what's the so what's, what's the quote proctor better to have what? a uh, hundred a hundred functions that can operate on one piece of data than 10 functions that can operate on 10 different types of data right Alan perlis yeah that's it it's perlis quote and and okay and then what's the go function that's just that's the asynchronous mechanism for channels, uh, continuation passing style. If you're in JavaScript world, think of this as like modern JavaScript, JavaScript six and above. Think of this as async in JavaScript, and this piece. Await, right? Yep, and. Is the equivalent of a word. Okay, so all the all the smarts are in the execute function. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it allows you. That's what that that was kind of the goal was. The context is data. The context is just a map. The execution chain is just a sequence that will turn into stuff that will turn into a queue for you. The executor will turn into a queue so it can do easy operations of like pop efficiently and things like that. But then it's just like, hey, it's just data. You can manipulate both. You get the benefits of the map being just data and an open and extensible map, as they talked about in that data oriented programming. And it kind of goes beyond data oriented programming because when I was asking Johanathan about it, this is almost even data driven, which he distinguishes as well, because it's like, nope, you're setting this whole up thing up as a piece of data, which you define, and then something else will run it entirely. So what you're being able to do is define your execution flow as data. And then the execute here is the piece that knows how to do that manipulate. It's kind of like, it'd be like if you defined a state machine as or a router as well, or a router. router. Right. Okay. And then, and then, then the execute function, that's what's stepping through. It, it takes each one of those interceptor functions says, I'm going to run enter, 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 enter. If I, I'm going to check periodically for an error. If I get through all that, I'm going to do the leave, 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 leave. Yep. And I'm going to do the awaiting. If you return me something async. So I'm going to look at your result. Is this result reduced? Cool. Or even is this result? Is this result when you say like result, you mean the returned context? Yes, the returned context is the returned value, the returned context, and it's not necessarily the context because it could be wrapped in a channel. Is this thing a future of some sort? Is this an asynchronous promise? In this case, it's a go channel. Is this thing a channel? Okay, get stuff out of that channel, pluck it out of that channel. If what now I've got the actual context that was embedded in that channel. So essentially, in type in static type world, is it a future? And I have to pluck out of the future, and then I can look at that context and say, is this context have an error on it? Okay, it's got an error. Exit. Is this context marked as a reduced value? Okay, now go to leave. Is this context otherwise? I've got the context. Now go on to the next enter. If there is another enter in the queue. Otherwise, start processing the leave chain. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. And, and, and then, so that's why you can interleave like the logging because it just takes the context, it, it shoves it to its log and then it passes it. Along. Okay. I, I think I actually understand this now. And, and it's high and it's abstracting between like, I can return you some, I can return you a future monad or I can just read of a context or I can just return you a context. And you don't have to worry about because all your interceptor knows and your interceptor can decide which it needs to return 
but you always get in just the context and the executor will do that unwrapping for you and feed that through appropriately and stack it appropriately if needed. So it, it, that's where I'm saying, that's where the uniformity of, is this a future? Or is this a future of context? Okay, which is this? Or is this a future of error and an exception, which means I need to put in, because I'd also check to see, did you actually raise an exception? Or do you have an exception in your future? And that's how it knows that says, oh, you actually got an exception. Let me take that exception, put it on the context, and now I'll start running back through the error path. Because it's a future of context or a future of error or an error or a caught exception kind of thing. And so it hides that away from you. And you can just think in terms of your data pipeline that you need to do and let it worry about the execution of that as well. In a sense, like to extend that a little, in a sense, what it's doing is it's taking and creating that execute, like that core executor. It's taking and creating like a standard interface for the glue code that you would normally need and would normally be required for each and every single one of those kind of workflow steps. And then with that, like, you can like, because it's abstracted away that in that fashion, you've defined that standard interface. You can take all the, that responsibility of the glue code, consolidate it into a single abstract location. Chris has his hand up. Yeah, um, I'm just curious. This is an um, almost an implementation detail in the specifics of closure. But when you return an asynchronous thing, how does that asynchronous process signal that you need to in, you need to switch over to the um, error processing model? The, I mean, obviously, if it returns a map that looks like the context, that's going to be a context. But how does it say something went wrong? Essentially, it does a type check on it. If it's in JavaScript world, it looks at the, is it a JS error? Or otherwise, it looks at, is this a throwable in Java so, land? So you actually return a reified exception. You don't throw the exception, obviously. It's a hey, well, throwing the. Yeah. If you're in synchronous mode, it will catch the exception for you. Right. I'm thinking of the if asynchronous in particular. Yeah. If you're in async mode, then you return the exception itself. Instead of throwing it, you just return the channel. Okay. So essentially in non in type system world, you would either return your future of your context, or if you caught an exception, you would, would do a try catch in your function that takes the context in. And if you caught, instead of returning a future of context, you'd return a future of the exception type. Did you consider, was, or do you also support if the, in the case of a channel, it closes without returning anything? No, I did not account for that. That may work too. The problem with returning a channel if without closing, Getting an error if you don't get anything. It may actually throw that as an exception, but the problem is you lose what that exception would be because you have no data on it. Yeah, right? it's awfully vague. <laughs> so, the, so the idea and the goal is to put the exception on the channel, and we'll look at the ex we'll look on that result, and if it's an exception result that we got off the channel, that's the easy win. I may have accounted for nils uh, or empty channel closes. I don't remember, but uh, I think that was a lower case, priority case because you're like, you don't actually get much data from that, so. No, but it does save you the mildly artificial, I'm going to, I've encountered an exceptional condition that's not an exception, but let me turn it into an exception. Yeah. But that's not really that much work. And I, 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 see, I see your point. Closing the channel is relatively devoid of context. Literally. Yeah, and that's funny how that worked out. You nerd. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I swear it wasn't on purpose. So I, I kind of had a, another question. Um, so I'm trying to just wrap my head around the, the enter leave concept. So, I mean, is this maybe the right mental model if I were to transport this over to like an object oriented setting, for example, you might have a function or I'm sorry, you might have a, a class that has a constructor and has a function called invoke, right? Like this is how a lot of middle tier or middleware middlewares are set up. Um, and then basically the idea is that you would inject uh, the next class in your in your middleware setup into the constructor of the of the the current class. And so essentially what you do is you call the constructor of the current class and then it by default calls the next constructor. So in a sense, the constructor is the enter and the instructor the constructor sort of chains from one class to the next. And then invoke would be the leave function. Um, and once that class calls invoke, effectively it, it gets disposed. It, it would it would go away. And so then, as you call the chain of constructors, you go through the cons uh, you, you call sort of the enter function through the constructors. Once everything's constructed, you call invoke at the bottom of the stack and you move back to the top of the stack. I mean, is that kind of like? I mean, I think this method actually just looking at this, um, I've worked with systems that look sort of like that. And this is much more attractive because you can sort of list things out as a simple array. <laughs> and it seems like a lot easier to interleave things, uh, whereas it's very challenging to interleave things in that kind of perspective. But I mean, is that sort of what the approach that you're kind of trying to model with this or is that uh, a good analogy in the object-oriented world? A better analogy in the object-oriented world might be, again, it's against everything you would do in, <laughs> an object oriented world but enter if you're going to do that if you're going to take your analogy of your enter where it takes the next item as the constructor it would be your teardown then you have a teardown function you have your disposable function that would be your leave or your error handler I guess I'm, I'm thinking and then that would flow that would fl essentially super back up that way too right I mean, have multiple thing... inheritance in this object-oriented language that you're thinking of, because <laughs> if so, you could have a, a, a inherit from yeah. an no. interceptor class that defines an enter and leave an error function. I, mean, I wasn't I thinking was... in that metal, but I was thinking of using like the constructor as the enter, basically, because that's created as soon as a class is created, and then uh, one constructor then calls the next constructor. Um, and the constructor can have side effects and can can change the the model. And then um, once all the constructors have been created, uh, the constructor the uh, the last guy calls an invoke and basically disposes of itself. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to think like um, how if it's if it's sort of maybe a, a simpler way to do it without sort of recreating the interceptor pattern. But I, I don't think it's as pretty as this. So I think it's a pretty cool little framework you, that, that this is. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. I mean, maybe if you took advantage of things that were disposable or like yeah. with C++ where you had your deconstructor or Java and I think that had your disposable. So essentially that's your teardown for your class. And if all you had was just set up and tear just constructor and tear down and did all your side effects in there and never worried about exceptions. That might be your enter and leave in a weird kind of squinty thing. Uh, some of this is also the reason I, this almost responds thinks makes me think of common lisp with their, uh, their inheritance in common lisp where you have your before, after, around. And this feels like your before and after where you can say, hey, here's this thing, I, but I've got a before and after chain that gets populated through this and I can do logic in there. And, and then that inheritance goes through if you're talking about a common Lisp object system, object inheritance with a before, after, and you don't have the around, but your interceptor itself represent each part, each the before and after of that 
you might be able to pull something janky off by like using like a constructor and and like a uh, destroy for like each class then use like a visitor pattern to go over like a series of cl of classes that have been like instantiated but then and, and like the initial pass over the to construct everything passing in a common data set that's like not directly like isolated within the class itself and then once that's once you've done that on all the enters like execute all the disposes all of the like destroys on like a second uh visitor pattern pass i mean that would be kind of weird but it might work is there any so we've got these three functions enter leave and error is that exhaustive is there any reason that one would maybe want to have four functions i don't know what the fourth the, that fourth function would be but i'm just Around. wondering is, is that the correct number that's probably the most standard standard number it is something that we did discuss quite a bit the other possibility would be kind of like an around function in the aspect oriented style that Proctor was mentioning. So like anytime that around thing, like anytime that interceptor gets hit, there's like a function that's executed around the, the life that specific execution. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. There was an idea of doing that with like a yield to the next interceptor kind of thing, but the other thing where this is what I was talking about, where because it's maps, I can put whatever I want in it. So this is the condition system. So I've got a retry HTTP interceptor that has a key of HTTP request failed. And what it does is it says, okay, partial retry request three. So I've got, I can go in here. So this is a simple signal thing. Uh, it takes the stack off the context, and this is doing a loop. So a forehead comprehension. So for every interceptor, and it's this is really loop recur. Uh, so it unrolls it. So without doing recursion. So if we have an interceptor, and if that interceptor has a signal, so we got a signal variable. If that signal key is in that map, get the function out of that. So if we have a function with that, that use it, then we can apply that function with the context and the rest of the args. And otherwise we, so we can walk up a stack because we have the stack, we can walk up the stack, look for, look for that actual item. Uh, So I have a requeue current. So this is just a helper that will take the stack, take the current as a queue, and add the existing queue and peek into the stack and put that as and pop that item off the stack. So because I'm going to retry it, I don't want to keep adding it to my stack. I just want to like retry this thing three times. And if it keeps failing, whatever the current thing is, don't keep adding a cleanup. Like if you have that leave, if you retry it five times. Don't do the leave five times, just do that leave once. So it will pop off the stack and remenge the stack and then update the queue and update the stack with that item. So here I got a one, I got the double. And then this was just a test of the EQ current. So if I do this, it would evaluate it and just make sure the stack, make sure the queue in the stack looked right. This was some fake requests. Yeah, so status is a 200 to 200 to 200 or 500. 
So it's my fake HTTP request. So I pass it some URL and the status is going to come back as one of those. So it was my status between was in that was that in the 200 range and I'm glossing over this quite a bit, but we can see retry request. And so this will say, hey, what's the max retry count? So in this case, I'm going to like later on, you'll see I'll set it up as three. So three, try re three times, take the context, and then here's the request and here's the response and you can do stuff. So we get the URL from it. Again, this is another thing of like putting it in a map. So here's my namespace keyword for my condition system request retries with this URL. So I've got deeply nested map of here's my request retries with this given URL. How many times have I counted this thing? How many times have I retried it? Uh, and if they retry counts too many, we get too many failures and then do a fake timeout. And so it's a incremental back off. So we're going to timeout or incremental back off if we fail. And so what we do is I have a HTTP request failed that has that retry request for three times. And here is my request interceptor. So I'm going to try, get the request, get the response. If the response was not a success, I'm going to, I'm going to do a simple signal. This thing is the thing that will walk up that stack and see if there's anything on that stack execution stack that will match that signal. So go signal HTTP request failed. And it will look at the stack of execution and say, hey, was there anything with this key? Was there any interceptor with this key HTTP request failed? And if there is, it's gonna get the context, the request and the response. And then we can get the response back. And so, this is just saying, hey, if I'm requeued multiple times, it only gets one runs. Oh, so we get a fake time. So in retry request, so we get a response. It's status of 500. We're in the retry. It retries fake times out, and then it succeeds. So if I run this a number of times. That one worked the first time, time, first time. That one backed off again. And then there's some real, there's some weird inheritance stuff you can get where you can derive keywords. So I can redrive, I can derive a bunch of keywords. So quadruped is derived from animal. Dog is derived from mammal. It's also derived from quadruped. Sporting breed is a dog. Beagle is a sporting breed. You got a flying ace is a beagle and a flying ace is a pilot. And so if we evaluate all of these, we can get a derivation hierarchy of like flying ace. And we can see how the flying ace is derived from various things. Dog, eagle, and then there was like an advanced handler signal. So this is where I was like, you can get really goofy because that stack is just data. I can walk, I can go get a derivation hierarchy for uh, that signal. And if it's, if it's the flying ace, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight items, for each one of those eight items, I can go consume the stack, look for that key in the interceptor stack. So walk up that stack eight times without actually like ruining my stack trace by traversing that stack eight times, looking for each one of those keywords from least specific to more specific kind of thing and find those keywords and say, hey, can I find this thing? And if I do invoke that function. So this is just, again, this is foot, pure foot gun stuff if you're not careful, but it shows you the fact that because this is all just data, I can go, I have, like, if you get an exception, you can't walk your stack trace to figure out your context of your exception. 
I'm like, how was I called? What do I need to do? Does somebody else up higher know how to handle this for me to continue? This allows that to kind of signal that idea because I can go consume my stack without actually consuming it and inspect it and look at it because it isn't just data and be able to get that. So that's where I was like, this is kind of aspect oriented and condition system stuff that's again, advanced foot gun. But when you start to see things as just pure data, it becomes really interesting what you can start to get away with. And just to point out to your question, Claude, like I put an interceptor on that doesn't have an enter. It's just got a retry request. And I could signal a HTTP request failed derives from a retry request. And so I can signal an HTTP request failed, but I could also derive a SQS message publish failed and I could try that and it can try that logic again and requeue that SQS message publish or something else. But I've got a interceptor because it's just data and I can stick another key in there and take advantage of that without needing it. And before more people leave, I put a dropped a note in for 40% off the manning book. So if you hadn't yet got grokking simplicity or data oriented programming, uh, pod geekery 20, I have for my podcast, get you 40% off of that. So you can look in the chat and take advantage of that discount as well. If you haven't gotten those books yet. But now that I've touched on that, any other questions? I don't know if that, I don't know if that's what you were alluding to, Claude, but just another thing of because that interceptor is an open map, I can put stuff on. There is no enter, there is no leave. They get treated as identity. I'm just stashing stuff off there in the stack that I can then go back and later look at. And again, the executor itself doesn't care about it, but something else can go back and look at that and go inspect there and find it if it wants to. All right. Um, thank you so much for this. This was really interesting. Um, any other questions before I stop the recording? And we can keep talking after that. But um... mine is if you all come across this in other lands, let me know because I want to see who's done uh, something else like this. And again, as I mentioned, maybe something with Haskell has something with that. With what was it? Uh, the resource T and something else. But I'm like, I don't even know that as well because I haven't looked too deep into that one. Conduit, but yeah, if you all come across something, I'm curious to see if any other language has done something similar or just even if it's not as completely open map kind of stuff as it is, but like here's a record that kind of passes through and you build this out. I'd just be kind of like the geek in me wants to know where else this pattern has been applied or if this is just something solely niche to closure. Okay, well, we will do that. Um, on that uh, uh, note, I wanna um, thank you so much. This was really interesting and um, I'm going to stop the recording once I can figure out where it is. Well, thank you to Chris and Andrew for piping in because they were developing it with me. So they were, I'm glad they were able to give, help shed some other perspectives on this as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Glad to be here. Oh, okay.